Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word again. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for its timeless poignancy. And we ask, Lord, that you will use it today to make us more like you. Amen. Every week, she was there. There at the door, fearful, confused, uncertain. She didn't remember where she was. She didn't remember how she got there, why she was there, and she didn't know who the people were around her. I don't think... She even remembered who she was. I don't think she remembered anything in the last 50 years. But each Sunday afternoon, when we used to visit Dad in the nursing home, she was there, waiting at the door for someone to pick her up, ready with a handbag. In fact, you had to be very careful that she didn't get out when you came in the door. <clears throat> this poor lady's dementia caused her to be disorientated and very anxious. The tragedy was the anxiety which was so real to her did not reflect reality. The reality of her circumstances, where she was safe and where she was cared for. That was 20 years ago now, but that lady made an impression on me and I, I still think about her at times and her inability to remember and the effect it had on her. Yet when I think about her life, in a sense, she can be an illustration for us as individuals, for a society, even for a nation, as to what happens when we don't remember, when we forget our history, our identity, and as we see today in this passage, in our God. If we don't remember, we can be confused, we can be anxious, we can go in the wrong direction, and we can be easily led by others. We are unable to find solutions. We become self-obsessed, fearful, and sometimes angry. And I don't know if it's just me, but I see these things in every news bulletin and increasing in our society. In this passage today, we see Moses repeatedly imploring the people of Israel about the importance of remembering, to remember the Lord their God, to remember the blessing that comes with obedience, to remember all that he has done for them, and to remember all that he has promised that he will do for them. Remembering the Lord changes you today. But Moses also warns of the disastrous consequences if they fail to remember and obey. So let's just remember the context of this passage of the book of Deuteronomy. Remember the Lord has miraculously rescued the people of Israel from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. He was bringing them into the land that he had promised. 
And on the way they had received the Ten Commandments and made a covenant with the Lord and other laws. But then disobedience caused them to wander. Wander around and round and round in the wilderness, and it's a pretty small area for 40 years. Failing to remember and disobedience has some pretty bad consequences. We can go round and round. Now that first generation died out <clears throat> and now a new generation was on the verge of entering this promised land. And the book of Deuteronomy is basically Moses telling this new generation their history and repeating the law to them so that they might be successful and blessed as they move into the promised land. If they remember and if they obey. And all this occurred around 1400 years before Jesus was born. In verse 1, Moses encourages the gathered crowd. He says, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on earth to your ancestors. And then through verse 2 to 5, Moses wants them to remember how the Lord led them in that wilderness for 40 years. God's purpose there, we see, was to humble, to test, to teach them. And this process we see in those verses would also expose what was in their heart and whether or not they would keep the Lord's commands. The Lord humbled them, verse 3, by causing them to hunger, and then he fed them on manna, which no one had ever heard of. Manna was a flaky white substance that the Lord provided on the ground six days out of seven a week. And they, people could collect that. They could eat it. Apparently it tasted like honey a bit, but they could also use it like flour and make cake and um, bread out of it. In the wilderness, they were utterly dependent on the Lord in providing that manna for them each day for their survival. And this was, verse 3 again, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We live in a universe that was created by the word of the Lord being spoken. And he created manna for their sustaining. But he also created wheat and sun and rain for it to grow. And therefore God is the source of the bread that we eat each day to meet our physical needs. He's the ultimate source even of that stuff we buy in the supermarket. And so we see we are dependent upon him and the systems he's put in place in nature that, that produces that for us. Now, living on every word that comes from the mouth of God is acknowledging our dependence on God as the source of our spiritual life, of our physical life, of the abundant life that we read of in the New Testament, and indeed eternal life. It's all supplied by him. Remembering that we are dependent upon the Lord for our spiritual and physical well-being is reinforced when Jesus quotes this very verse back to Satan 
when he has been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. Moses reinforces how graciously the Lord met their needs over that time of wandering in verse 4 when he refers also to their clothes not wearing out and to their feet not swelling, both, again, miraculous provisions. And then he sort of summarises that by saying, as a man disciplines his son, verse 5, so the Lord your God disciplines you. What's the purpose of discipline? So that we learn something, so that we change our behaviour. Better still, that we develop character within ourselves. Now, the people of Israel were disciplined with hunger for a time, but also just by those years of wandering. And the clear lesson to learn for them was to trust, to obey the Lord, because he has miraculously provided their needs, their food, their clothing, protection, and also the law, and even getting them out of Egypt in the first place. Verses 15 and 16, if we skip down, again reinforce what the Lord has done for them. He led you through the vast and wonderful wilderness. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat. And the purpose of all this? To humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. This reinforces verse 1. Follow every commandment so that you will live and increase. And verse 6, it builds on as well. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. Willing obedience is the appropriate response in light of all that God has done for them and in light of who God is. And it all this builds on that overall theme of Deuteronomy. Obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed. But there is more to remembering than just what the Lord has done for them. There is remembering what the Lord has promised he will do for them. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and springs and gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey, Bread won't be scarce. You will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. This is an abundant and wonderful place that he's bringing them into. So here is the nation of Israel standing out on the plains of Moab, listening to Moses, remembering all that the Lord has done in their escape from 400 years of slavery, in providing, protecting and guiding them to this point. But they are also remembering the Lord's promise for their future, of this land flowing with milk and honey that the Lord will give them. In fact, they can see it. It's just there. It's across that river, the River Jordan, Maybe they can smell it. I think they can almost taste it. What Moses says in verse 10, when you have eaten from the produce of the land and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. All this remembering of past and future, I imagine, would have brought... Much anticipation, a growing confidence in seeing how the Lord has provided and enabled and an excitement with that. 
but be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Moses warns them in verse 11. How could they forget all that? It's pretty easy, actually. Do not forget God. He is the one who has done and will do all this stuff. And do not forget the Lord by failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I am giving you this day, says Moses. Moses warns them because he knows and the people themselves should know how fickle their hearts are. Otherwise, verse 12, when you see, sorry, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, your silver and gold increase, everything's multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you'll forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery, which leads into verse 17. You may say to yourself, my power and my strength, my hands have produced this wealth for me. It's a common trap. Look at that contrast between 15 and 16. He led, he brought, he gave, and verse 17, my power, my strength, my hands. <laughs> One is an historical truth of what God has done. The other is a proud lie. There is no such thing as a self-made person. Do we hear that expression? How do we know that? Because of verse 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. The Lord gave you the brain, the skill, perhaps a nurturing family, and the health to produce what we have. We are either going to praise the Lord, we see in verse 10, or we're going to forget the Lord and in pride and foolishness praise ourselves. But it's not about us. But now, let's see, Moses raises the stakes and the consequences much, much higher now that if Israel is silly and rebellious enough to forget, Verse 19, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. These consequences now are getting pretty serious, aren't they? Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. And tragically, the Bible and history show this came true. The consequences of Israel's forgetfulness and disobedience meant that about 700 years after entering this wonderful land, 10 out of the 12 tribes of Israel were defeated and were dispersed throughout the Assyrian Empire. They are gone. They are lost until history. They are no more. But then, only 136 years after that, many of those remaining two tribes had again forgotten, and they were taken away into exile in Babylon for 70 years, dispossessed of their land, see? Taken away from the promise that was theirs. Praise God, he is faithful to his covenant, 
and he preserved a remnant of Israel even till today. This passage clearly shows us the powerful consequences of remembering or forgetting. Like Israel, we need to remember the Lord. What do we remember about him? We can remember the fullness of his character and how that has affected us. His love, his mercy, his grace, and his wrath and justice and judgment so that we revere him. God is all those things, even those things which appear opposite. We can remember, we can be in awe and take comfort and encouragement by remembering what the Lord has done in history, what we've just read about him doing, rescuing Israel, his miraculous saving, provision and protection for them. But we can also remember his saving, provision and protection of us in our lives. We have the advantage of knowing that this long-awaited for, long-promised, long-prophesied for Messiah, Jesus, has come. And in his death, he offers to take our sin upon himself, to take the just punishment that it deserves, so that we don't have to, so that we may be forgiven. Even more, we might be declared righteous in God's sight. And his resurrection means we too can have new life. We too can have a fresh start in him. And like Israel, we have promises for the future that we need to remember too, much better than, than a nice bit of land. We have the promise that God will dwell with us, with his people. We will dwell with him in that place where there'll be no more mourning, crying, tears or pain. And where we read that he wipes every tear from our eyes. How good is that future? But just like Israel, we too can forget all of that, all of this wonderful stuff, and experience the negative consequences because we do. Instead of enjoying a purposeful, intentional, and joyful walk with the Lord, we can drift. Drift away and drift along with the Lord, uh, uh, with the world. Away from the Lord. And, and who's ever drifted down a river, sat there and you carried along? <laughs> you realize as you drift, you've moved a lot faster and further away <laughs> than you thought you would in a shorter space of time than you thought you would. It doesn't take long once we forget to drift. We forget who we are in Christ. We forget what he has done in history and for us. And we forget what he wants us to do. Instead of feeding on God's word, we listen to what the world is saying about all sorts of things. And like that lady we get confused. We lose our bearings. We get confused, and that's expressed often in a lack of moral clarity. Oh, it seems all right. Well, everyone's doing it. It's now 52% of the population on some survey. It must be. Have you noticed how that's how we determine morality today? <laughs> ABC runs another survey. And so when we're in that 
sort of drifted stage, drifting stage, then, well, it's, then it's a bit easier to compromise, isn't it? And so then it's easy to make excuses. We justify oh, it's because and this and that and them and blame and whatever. And then now we're in this position where we're going to cause damage. Damage to ourselves, damage to others, relationally, perhaps financially, perhaps sexually, or in whatever area. And then we can get to this point where we've drifted so far now, it's sort of getting embarrassing. One of the things we're going to do is avoid fellowship with each other. That just happens. And then we don't want to hear the Lord and his word because by then we've pretty much got our backs to him. So I hope you see how much is at stake when it comes to remembering or forgetting. So, the $64 question, how do we remember? What's gonna help us? Hang in there, not drift. Keep our eyes on the prize, on the Lord. And you know what? I, I, we look at Israel and we just go, mm, how could you? The sea just opened. The, the <laughs> manna, water from it. How could they be so silly? Well, I tell you what. I think that question, how do we remember, is more important for us than for Israel because I reckon we're more prone to forget than even Israel. For several reasons. And I think as, as we look at trying to apply this, let's just think about, let's try and understand our current quite unique context in terms of the history of the world. <laughs> because we are in a unique place. The digital age has revolutionised everything. And there's... A lot of good with that, but there's also a lot of very powerful distractions and there's a lot of very bad and destructive stuff. There's a full spectrum of stuff there online, isn't there? I looked up three different surveys to clarify this result and they all came within a few minutes of each other. The middle one said this, the average person spends two hours and 27 minutes on social media a day. The average 17-year-old spends 5.8 hours on social media a day. I am not talking about video streaming, YouTube, TikTok. That's in addition. I am not talking about gaming and gambling. That is in addition to that two and a half hours. And on top of that, you can add, you know, Netflix, Disney, whatever. You sit down, you do your two and a half hours, and so then you, then you, you know, watch a movie on Netflix. Well, that's five. I hope we all are well aware that the entire thing is designed to keep you scrolling, keep you watching, keep you gaming. Really smart people with really smart algorithms and really smart psychology are behind it all. So don't give them the pleasure once you know that. <laughs> Still worse is the corrosive, destructive, and murderous consequences of porn. And for the first time this week, with the outrage 
at the horrific levels of domestic violence going on in our country and our area is about the worst in the country, porn was, was finally put out there as, oh, this might be having an effect. At least it was, <laughs> it was put out there by, by a number of people. So this is our context. Let's just acknowledge the powerful and addictive effect and all the time that our screens are taking from us because there has never been a time like it. Another thing to understand is that a follower of Jesus is a disciple and a disciple is by definition a learner. Ain't rocket science, but I think it's good to remember. So just think about the, the, the massive scope here, right? From Genesis to Revelation, from uh, creation to the second coming. Think about all the things we could, we could, you know, learn about God's character, about the cross, about the prayer, about fasting, about reading the Bible, about sharing our faith, about defending our faith, about Christian history, about missions, about how politics today is affecting our faith in different parts of the world, about our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted today, the 4,000 Nigerians that were killed last year, the amazing miracles that the Lord is doing in Iran, bringing a revival in the midst of this Islamic culture and a million other topics that we could look into that would help us remember and strengthen our faith. So I've got to ask you, with, with that grand suite of options, if all these things of God, about God, spark no interest in you, or at least not enough interest to draw you away from other things. You need to have a really hard think about where you are with the Lord right now. How is your context? How is the media that you consume affecting you? affecting your relationship with the Lord. As the writer to Revelation asked the Ephesian church, has your love grown cold for the Lord in the face of this onslaught of distraction? So what's going to help us remember? That's our context. What's going to help us remember? Repentance, as usual, <laughs> is always the best place to start. Acknowledge where you're at with the Lord. If you have drifted, and how far down your priorities list, your to-do list, is the Lord. And as we repent, confessing these things to the Lord, learn to wait, to sit with the Lord, as we're bringing these things before him. Wait with the Lord in this liberating place of confession and repentance, handing your sin to him. And also receiving the forgiveness that he wants to offer. Stay in that place with him and do both things. Confess and receive. 
Remembering is intentional and corporate. It is something we do together. Israel had a system of worship and sacrifice. They had uh, annual festivals that they would gather together for. They had the first five books of the Bible that we have that Moses wrote, and they were read out, out loud, at these festivals where they had gathered. And later on in history, the Psalms and the prophets were added to those first five books, making up the Old Testament. And then each week they were read and taught and expounded in the synagogue. Synagogue is a, is a Jewish meeting form. And when you think about it, the public gatherings to remember that they had are quite similar to the ones we have today, actually. And that is why we need to be intentional and committed to gather together as we are this morning and each week, to gather together, to hear the word, to worship the Lord, to open the Bible and to encourage one another. I'm loving the IPL at the moment, the cricket in India. <laughs> and, yeah, it's raining. We can all see that. But let's get our conversation beyond those things as we have our cup of tea today. Ask each other how they're going. How, you, how can you encourage each other? Remembering is also intentional again, but also personal. We can use the vast resources of the internet to help us to remember and to grow in the Lord. There is so much good stuff out there. And that is why I regularly put links in the newsletter to that really helpful stuff that will build us up as quality resources. But at the end of the day, it is still the Lord himself we are to seek. And I know there are lots of devotional apps out there and stuff we can put on our phone, a new version, and send us a, a verse of the day and all that stuff, and that's helpful. But the best thing to do is switch it off. Really. Put it in another room or put it on silent. Put the phone away when you come to meet with the Lord because it's going to bing, bell and whistle and whatever and distract you. And just because it's there and you haven't looked at it for more than five seconds, you, you want to and all sorts of stuff. So here's my quick guide to a fresh start with the Lord, okay? Or, or if you're new to setting aside time with the Lord, if that's something you, you're really not at all even familiar with. Here's my quick, helpful guide. Number one, put the jug on, make a cuppa. And what I mean by that is you're making intentional time. Open up a paper Bible and go to the Gospel of Mark. Now, you, you might have been doing this for decades. That's great. It might help you, but I'm, I'm talking to other people perhaps today. Start with the book of Mark. And then pray. Ask the Lord to help you focus, to help you as you open up his word to, to love and understand him better through your time with him. Make sure you have a notebook. Paper Bible, paper notebook. And as you're reading through Mark, just write down what you learn about Jesus. What's he doing? What's he saying? How's he interacting with people? 
What do we see about his character? It's dot points about Jesus. And after that, just jot down some more points then about the people. How the people interact with Jesus. Are they embracing him? Are they rejecting him? What are they saying? What are they doing? And then reread, reflect, and write down in a few words what you can learn from this passage about the interactions, about what Jesus taught. Maybe summarize it really briefly. Then pray about what you have learned, what you have summarized, what you have observed, and how that might apply to you. Then do it again tomorrow. Just read the next section. Don't go around the book. Don't uh, <laughs> no, just that chapter, that bit, bit by bit. And by the time you've finished Mark, you'll have a skill set which you can then use in other books as well. The benefits of this way are two, at least. Unlike an app, whatever, you're not so passive. You actually, you've got a pen in your hand. You're, you're, you're thinking directly on that. The app isn't telling you what is. You're interacting. You've opened yourself to the Holy Spirit to teach you. So you're more, you're less passive. The other benefit is that now you've got a record. You can flick back. Oh, what was that last? Oh, the Lord really challenged me on that thing, you know. And now you've got a book of your walk with the Lord, that you can go back. I've got boxes of these books that I've got over the years I could go back on in my garage. I don't tend to do it, but they're there, and I one day perhaps I will. It's a good thing to do. It's important to remember the Lord. Prioritizing time to remember the Lord will change you today. It will impact. Bit by bit, it will change you over a life. Because that's what God wants to do, change you. To be more like Jesus. And so that means there is massive scope and potential for us, isn't there? <laughs> There's Jesus, we're here or there or there. There's a lot of growth. It positions you doing this to receive the love, joy, peace, the clarity, and so much more that the Lord wants you to have in becoming more like him. Let's remember to remember. Heavenly Father, we see the importance of remembering you, of spending time with you, of obeying you, of loving you, of being with you, of being changed to be like you, and of doing what you want us to. God, I pray that your spirit will be moving in us today to make a fresh start, to open ourselves to all that you want to do in us as we open your word and open our lives to you. Amen.